You're listening to the Mother to Baby Podcast, medications and more during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Ask the experts with your host, genetic counselor and mama four, Chris Stallman. This episode contains evidence-based information that's current as of the day recorded and may change as more data becomes available. To get the very latest information about this topic or other topics in pregnancy and breastfeeding, please contact a mother-to-baby specialist at 866-626-6847, by text at 855-999-3525, or through our website at mothertobaby.org. Welcome to another episode of the Mother to Baby podcast. My name is Chris Stallman, and I am a genetic counselor, a mother of four, and a teratogen information specialist. So what I do is I talk to people, patients, family members, healthcare providers, about exposures that can happen before pregnancy, during pregnancy, while breastfeeding, and in cases of adoption. And an exposure can be anything. So it could be a medicine, it could be a vaccine, it could be a chemical that you work with. On today's show, we're actually going to talk about something not only very special, but also very, very important. And we have a special guest to help us out. Dr. Kat Kayani is a psychologist in private practice specializing in perinatal mental health. She is host of the Mom and Mind podcast with Dr. Kat and author of the Pregnancy Workbook, Manage Anxiety and Worry with CBT and Mindfulness Techniques. She began specializing in perinatal mental health after her own experience with postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, and postpartum OCD. So that's obsessive compulsive disorder. She now supports and advocates for perinatal families in any way she can. And today she is our special guest. Kat, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to, um, you know, talk about this topic and hopefully help somebody out there who's listening. That sounds great. So let's jump right in. First and foremost, can you explain to us what is postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, and postpartum OCD? Sure. Um, Yeah, so um, this is such an important question because um, perinatal depression, which can, uh, depression can happen during pregnancy and postpartum, is the most common complication of childbearing. It's very common, um, more common than people expect, really. Um, postpartum depression, uh, just in terms of what we're talking about right now, is um, a set of symptoms that can start, like I said, anytime during pregnancy or up to the first year postpartum. And it's not just within the first couple of weeks after birth or first couple of months. People are experiencing things like anger and irritability, um, sadness, crying, a lot of um, feelings of guilt or shame or even hopelessness. Um, People might be experiencing some appetite changes, either, you know, not feeling like eating much or eating more than they usually would. There are often sleep disturbances. Uh, sometimes feeling so exhausted that you feel like you need to sleep all of the time. Um, Or opposite that, there can also be some insomnia where it's hard to get to sleep. And when things get a little bit more difficult with um, postpartum depression is when people are also experiencing like a a lack of interest in the baby or even um, having difficulty connecting to their baby. Uh, even though they might be doing all of the things to take care of the baby, they might still not feel um, a connection. And that's that's incredibly upsetting for people because they feel like, you know, they, they should be connected and they want to be connected, but it's like hard to get there. Um, they could also be feeling a loss of interest just in, in things in general or joy or pleasure and things that they used to feel. And um, more severe symptoms could include... Um, thoughts of harm to yourself, 
um, or even uh, when it gets really, really difficult is feelings of not wanting to be alive. So you said that these are happening more often than people would imagine. So it sounds like this happens to a lot of people, but maybe we don't talk about it as much as we should. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, I've had four kids and especially with the last one, I had some medical complications after I was anxious all the time, but I didn't realize that maybe that's something I should have talked to my provider about. Do you find that, you know, these types of conditions are ones certainly that are happening, but maybe things that we don't talk about really like as a general community? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, when we were talking about numbers, um, it's anywhere from one in five to one in seven people are experiencing a perinatal mental health condition like depression uh, or anxiety or OCD. So postpartum anxiety can look and feel a lot like, you know, constant worry, uh, feeling like something bad is going to happen, kind of um, like worried that uh, there's a lot of what if, like what if something bad happens to me or my baby, but it kind of remains a question. And and I'll differentiate that with um, OCD in just a second. Um, But people can experience racing thoughts. There's often um, a a loss of sleep, um, maybe even like a fidgetiness or restlessness. And sometimes people can feel physical symptoms like um, dizziness or uh, heart rate changes um, that are really uh, physiological signs of anxiety. So it it is kind of categorized by a lot of worry that's difficult to manage. When we're talking about something like postpartum OCD, it is also um, worry, um, but you might be experiencing something more intense, more persistent worries, repetitive thoughts, um, mental images that are very upsetting, sometimes even graphic. um, And it can turn into, the worry can turn into an obsession. So something that you can't, or you feel like you you can't stop thinking about and uh, repeats over and over in your mind. And what happens with these types of obsessional thoughts or behaviors um, is that people can develop compulsions, which are essentially things that they do to try and minimize the thing that they're worried about. So, for instance, let's say a really common um, intrusive thought, Um, intrusive thoughts can happen with anxiety and depression and and OCD, but in this case, an intrusive thought is a thought that pops in your mind very quickly. It seems to come out of nowhere. It might be really intense, and it's something that you absolutely would never want to have happen. You hate that you're having the thought or the experience. And then you do something to try and not do that. So a common one is, what if I drop the baby? So uh, for some people who are having anxiety, and it remains kind of like, oh, gosh, oh, and then the the thought leaves. They're able to move on. But when it becomes an, an obsession, it's something they keep thinking about. And then they might start avoiding um, carrying the baby or avoiding going downstairs like walking down the stairs because they are trying to avoid the the bad thing from happening. So this can get really, really intense. Sometimes it, it results in a, in fears of not wanting to be alone with the baby or like I said, not going down the stairs or not wanting to drive um, because the anxiety is so high and the way that people are coping with it through the, let's say, avoidance, um, or let's say they're worried about germs or contamination, they may be constantly washing their hands or sanitizing everything that they could possibly be touching. But it's to a point where it is absolutely impacting their functioning. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do things, get, you know, get out the door and so on and so forth. So it it can become very intense. To your point, we, we are just not told about these potential conditions enough for us to be even aware of ourselves that it's something you know that we should be keeping an eye on so for people who are experiencing anxiety um what i find to be more true about anxiety than depression is that it 
is a little bit harder to kind of catch that you're feeling anxious or that, you know, how, how would somebody know that it's kind of the, the difference between kind of new mom, new parent anxiety versus uh, this is a clinical condition. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's a, there's a medical condition that's going on um, of, of a clinical anxiety. We're often told that, oh yeah, of course you're feeling anxious. You're a new parent and there's so much to learn. So we don't know what to look for uh, within ourselves or even to notice it as it being um, an anxiety rather than kind of just the, I guess you could say, new parent jitters or new mom jitters. or um, So it, 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 we're just not taught, really, is what it comes down to. And unfortunately, a lot of the providers who support pregnant and postpartum folks are also not taught. So um, it makes it really hard to notice what's happening. I think that's such an excellent point, too, about things like the messaging. Um, Again, you know, I've Mm -hmm. done this a couple of times and I have kids of various ages. But as long as I can remember, there was always, you know, of course, you're going to be, you know, tired. Of course, you're going to be anxious, just like you said. But things like, but you still have your baby. You're bonded to your baby. You love your baby. And like you said, you know, sometimes people don't experience that bonding right away. That, you know, Mm -hmm. is sometimes a thing. I'm so glad that you brought that up because in general, we're fed all these messages that we should be one way and we are taught to forget to look at how we feel individually. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And it's especially with the loss of sleep. I mean, it's sort of across the board. um, People are are losing sleep during the the postpartum stretch of time because there's so much to do. You're in a different schedule. Babies are on their own schedule. Um, and so, you know, to what you said earlier is, yeah, we're losing sleep and that's normal. Yes, it's normal to lose sleep. And it is common to feel anxious, but that doesn't mean you're, you are supposed to feel as anxious as some people do feel. Um, and so uh, it, the, the differentiation for me when I'm talking with somebody is like, is this kind of this, the new parent anxiety that comes along or is it something clinical is I'm wondering about the intensity of symptoms, mm-hmm. like how, how much is it impacting their life um, and the duration. So how long have they been experiencing symptoms? You know, for, for about 80% of people, there's a really, the, the really common and normal is the um, baby blues right. in those first couple of weeks after birth. Um, but if people are experiencing um, symptoms that are impacting their ability to function, like get through the day, um, and it's happening for you know longer than two weeks, then we're probably looking at something else that could benefit from additional support like therapy, potentially medication, depending on the intensity of symptoms. So now that we're on a roll about anxiety, let's keep that going. As a psychologist, what are some of the common questions that you get about managing anxiety through pregnancy and in the postpartum period? Yeah, it's a a great question. Um, People don't know how they can feel better when Mm -hmm. they're in the grips of what they're going through. So... um, I don't know whoever invented this old saying, like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But that's not a thing. Uh, (laughs) Thank you. Hang on. I have to stop you right here and say thank you. Thank you for that. So overused, and especially in the context of maternal mental health. I couldn't have said it better. That's not really a thing. (laughs) It's Unfortunately, people feel the pressure of this. Uh, saying. Um, mm-hmm. and, and maybe that's true a little bit more in kind of a Western individualistic culture. Mm. Might not be as much true in collectivist cultures. But the um, the difficulty here is that essentially what people um, are being asked to do as the person who's suffering is to also figure out how to get themselves out of their suffering mm-hmm. without having any help or skills or tools. 
so when people come to me for therapy, um, they, they are wondering, how do I not feel anxious? It, because it is, it can be constant, the, the, the worry about something happening to your child. And what's interesting about our brains and, uh, you know, in some ways fortunate, in some ways not uh, so fortunate, is that our brain can't always tell the difference between what is actually happening and what the anxiety or trauma or whatever it is is telling us could happen. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn how to override that and, and teach ourselves how to differentiate something that's actually happening versus something we're worried about happening. So a lot of the skills that we talk about or that people want and need to to know about is how to differentiate how to know how to in some ways like train their brain and their thought process out of the worry so we do a lot of identifying um thoughts and feelings um a lot of unfortunately we have to really focus on self-compassion um because the the anxious mind and the depressed mind is also an incredibly judgmental mind. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and you can go down the rabbit hole so fast with this and not even know that you're at the bottom of a pit um, of, you know, anxiety or despair um, because it can happen so quickly. So part of our, our process in therapy is trying to recognize that um, what's an anxious thought um, and, and sometimes it can feel really, really basic, but it's in some ways kind of retraining our, our brains um, and validate that we are having a hard time and that we can be gentle with ourselves about it. Like essentially treating yourself as you would treat somebody else who is going through the same thing. Ideally, you wouldn't be judging them. Mm-hmm. Ideally, you would be coming to them with comfort and support. And so getting out of anxiety, coping with anxiety can look a lot like that, depending on some other factors like the type of anxiety they're having, or if it's, if the anxiety is triggered by something from their past also. So it it can get a little complex, but um, the, the process to feeling better is just that it's a, it's a process that takes time and, um, and, compassion and um having support you know i the having support from people around you so some of the process is already figuring out how we can get um other folks involved in in like maybe taking care of baby um or finding ways for the birthing person to get more sleep which is actually really the first medicine So I've heard you say, you know, getting out of anxiety, this is a process that makes me think and believe that there's a light at the end of the tunnel so that there are ways that people can be effectively treated. And it's so important to have strong mental health and to be well treated during and after pregnancy. Is that your feeling as well, you know, that certainly there's some work involved, but there are viable processes. There are treatments out there that can help people get to where they want to be. Oh, absolutely. That's actually the, one of the most exciting parts of this, uh, is that these are a hundred percent treatable. Um, it, awesome. it, uh, I know people can get better because they see it all the time. Um, and I know people can get better because I got better. Um, it's, it, there, there are a lot of treatments available. Um, and thankfully there are more and more skilled and trained, um, therapists who are, who really, really understand what's going on with somebody who's who's going through this, like all the intricacies of, of the transition into parenthood. Um, so I, I, I'm so hopeful. Um, one of my absolute favorite things is, when I see somebody, you know, who, who has come in for help, who's just d- doesn't see how they can feel better. And then that one day, that one moment where they can finally see a little bit of that light, um, but where they can finally see a little bit of improvement for themselves. It's like their whole world opens back up 
and they feel like they can be themselves again. It is the coolest thing. <laughs> and I just, I'm at goosebumps right now. It's like my absolute favorite thing ever. So yes, people can get better. That's awesome. Um, Tell us a little bit more about your personal connection to the work that you do and how that influences the way you approach maternal mental health education. Yeah, so I went through uh, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, and postpartum OCD. I did not know that those things existed. Um, I was certainly anxiety or OCD in the, in the postpartum. I, you know, I was told that depression is a thing that can happen. Mm-hmm. And that was the extent of my training, really. Um, so even as a therapist, I didn't know what was going on with me. And when I, it took me a little while to figure that out. Um, and when I did, uh, my first thought was, how in the world is, I'm a therapist. Like, I went to school. I'm, this is, from for mental health um, and and I didn't know what was going on so how in the world are other people who don't have this training figuring this out and how many people are just suffering in silence like I did um so that is that is a huge driver for me is not wanting anybody else to suffer mm-hmm. um it, unnecessarily like th- there are so many things that we can do that are preventative um in in, in the sense that um we can prevent like very intense symptoms by having the right supports in place. Um, I'm not saying that we can make it not happen at all. We're, we're not magicians, right. but <laughs> there's um, there there's a lot we can do to support the person to ease their transition, um, especially if they have risk factors and all that, like I did. Um, and so I, when I'm sitting with somebody, I'm. I'm you know, trained as a therapist, I'm not talking about myself during therapy. Um, Other than when I see somebody else um, who needs a lifeline and needs to know that, uh, you know, they're not alone. I mean, people know that I've gone through stuff. That's not a secret. But um, part of the drive is, for me, is to make sure that nobody else suffers. So I, you know, I have my podcast, as you said, I do um, therapy with people, but I also volunteer my time with Postpartum Support International as a board chair. And I try from, from like sort of a a national global perspective to keep my hat on uh, that, um, that I, you know, the personal experience is really at the core of this. And then from that, how can we make change for individuals to make sure they get the help that they need. But also, man, like I said at the top, is just there, there needs to be so much more education for all providers, not just therapists, but every single person who comes in contact with um, someone who's pregnant or birthing or postpartum, um, I think anyways, should understand that these conditions can happen and also understand that they are treatable and that resources are available. I couldn't agree more. I think that it, it's exactly what you said. Anyone who comes in contact with people who are pregnant or in that postpartum period, because you never know, you know, where you catch them, you know, at what point, what things are happening. And it's always a good idea to not just know the signs, but also to be careful, you know, so mm-hmm. at, I was a prenatal genetic counselor in the clinic for a couple of years. And we always, as genetic counselors, are very careful about what we say. You know, we don't want to overly influence. We don't want to, certainly, we don't want to judge or come off biased in any way. And I think that even just those little things alongside the education, the recognition of the signs and symptoms go a long way to supporting someone when they're going through these things. Mm-hmm. So thank you for the work that yeah. you're doing and the work that you're advocating for more than that. I mean, you are excellent. You are one doctor. What I love is that you're out there supporting <laughs> and advocating for others. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I am positive that you're super mom, positive, super doc, super mom. <laughs> At the end of the day, you are one person, but you are helping the greater yeah. community focus too. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. I sure hope so. 
And Dr. Kapp, before we let you go, um, I wanted to remind everyone, actually, that May is Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month. So what would you say is the most important message that you would like to get across to the public as we bring maternal mental health issues to the forefront? It is absolutely 100%, 1,000% important that people know that this is a real thing that um, depression, anxiety, OC, all the things we talked about um, can happen. They, they do not discriminate. I, I really, really want people to know that they are not alone in this journey. Um, that there is help. Help is available. And with the right help, they can get back to their life. They can get back to being the parent that they want to be. Um, they can feel like themselves again it this is not a life sentence it is it is a part of the transition into parenthood for many people um, about 20 percent of people and this can happen to uh, birthing folks this, and this can happen to partners as well um so really we're looking at a a, a, a life phase a transition into parenthood that can affect us because, of course, it would. It's a, one of the biggest transitions in our life. Um, so what I really hope that the people who are listening to this know that that hope is there and available and that they can get the right help that allows them to live the life that they want to live with their family. And where can our audience find more information on your podcast, the Mom and Mind podcast, and the Postpartum Support International Group? Yes, absolutely. Um, post, uh, postpartum Support International, PSI, is at postpartum.net. And there is so much good information on the website, but also, and also, free support groups online. Um, there are and there are many other free resources available online. So anyone who's, who's suffering, anyone who has questions can go to that website and find help. Uh, for me and my podcast, the podcast is available everywhere. Podcasts are played, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Um, and you can go to momandmind.com uh, or my other website, wellmindperinatal.com. Excellent. Kat, we're going to call it a wrap for today, but I wanted to thank you so much for being here, for being present and for doing the work that you do. You know, I don't need to tell you how important this is, but the more we talk about it, the more information we can get out there. So thank you. Thank you so much. And that'll do it for this episode of the Mother to Baby podcast. As always, remember, you can find us wherever you can listen to podcasts. So on iTunes, Spotify, and Audible, for example. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a new episode. And you can go back through our old episodes as well. If you have an idea for the podcast, or if you want to be a guest, we want to hear from you. So please email us at contact us at mother to baby.org. And of course, don't forget mother to baby is here to give you information about exposures before and during pregnancy while breastfeeding and in cases of adoption. You can reach us by phone at 866-626-6847 by text at 855-999-3525. You can visit us on our website, mothertobaby.org, where you can chat with us. You can find episodes of the podcast, but also information sheets, information about our pregnancy studies, our fact sheets, our baby blogs, and so much more. Until next time, remember, Mother to Baby is here for you. Take care. Mother to Baby is a service of the nonprofit organization of teratology information specialists and supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's made possible through generous donations from listeners like you. To learn more about Mother to Baby, please visit mothertobaby.org.